Hello, and welcome to St. Thomas Episcopal Church and School here in San Antonio, Texas. I'm enormously glad you've joined us tonight for this third session of four in our teaching series on forgiveness. Uh, frequent watchers of this series and of these teachings, hello, how are you? Uh, we'll notice I'm not at my kitchen table today. Instead, I'm in the uh, Jane Wilson Library here at St. Thomas. Uh, really glad that you are here, too. Um, I looked over there because I just said hi to Jane Wilson. That's her picture over there. Uh, anyway, we're glad you're here. Uh, we were arrived at the session that for some of you will be the most difficult, and that is forgiving others. I remember a woman in a church uh, that I used to serve who was a complicated and, frankly, a very difficult person. I think she had been through a lot in her life, that she was going through a lot in her life when I knew her. Uh, she was, at the same time, a tremendously helpful, gifted, talented person, someone that you would love to have in your church. And at the same time, she was very judgmental and very unforgiving. Uh, it was easy for you to get on her bad side. And when you did, it was over for you. And when I found myself in the middle of one of these grudges that she was holding, uh, which was bound to happen, and you know, I've long forgotten what the grudge was even about or even who it involved. Uh, what I do remember is this. I said to her, just forgive them. And she shot right back at me and said, I don't forgive. I mean, how sad is that? I appreciated, quite honestly, her self-awareness and honesty with me to admit that she's not a forgiving person. Uh, most unforgiving people I know don't like saying that out loud, can't get themselves to admit it. So credit to her for that. Uh, but it made her really incapable of being a leader in a Christian church uh, because to do so, you need to be able to forgive. Uh, maybe you know people like this woman. Maybe you can relate to her, her yourself. Maybe you see in yourself an inherent inability to forgive. What makes us unforgiving? We're going to talk about this tonight together. Uh, how do we get ourselves to a place where we can forgive? Uh, how should we be on the lookout for the ways that God is going to help us with forgiving. Uh, in our first week, I made the case for why forgiveness is important. Uh, last week, we talked about how we can receive forgiveness from God, how the cross has opened up the door for us to be forgiving people. If you've missed either one of these two sessions, I invite you to go back and find it uh, on our Facebook page or YouTube channel. Uh, in Jesus, yes, God has forgiven us, removing the barrier that's between that, that sin has created between us and God. And with that forgiveness comes from God the expectation that we then forgive others. I've been a pastor a long time, and it always stuns and confuses me when I encounter a mean and unforgiving Christian. It still is a shock to my system. I never get used to it, um, that how you can be in an environment that promotes the forgiveness of sin and the grace of Jesus, and then be an unforgiving and ungraceful person. Uh, Jesus and his teachings, I need you to know, was not messing around about this. Uh, forgiving others is something that Jesus taught about clearly and quite intentionally. Uh, today, just for fun, and because I think this is a, as good a topic as any to do this, I'm going to read uh, scriptures to you, quite a bit of scripture tonight, actually, but I'm going to read entirely from the message version of the Bible. Uh, the me message is a paraphrase trans uh, translation, not a word-for-word -word translation, uh, done by the great Eugene Peterson. And um, uh, I think you'll enjoy, uh, and it's in contempt completely contemporary language, I think you'll enjoy, especially on these scriptures about forgiveness, hearing them from the message translation. So uh, I'm going to kind of anchor our talk tonight on this uh, parable of the unforgiving servant that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. And I'm going to read it in, in its entirety to you out of the message. Here it goes. 
At that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Jesus replied, seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. The kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant brought him before him, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of a hundred thousand dollars. He couldn't pay up. So the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants, who owed him ten dollars. He seized him by the throat and demanded, Pay up, now. The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. But he wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw what was going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, You evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. And that's exactly what my Father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. Wow. We can understand and appreciate the logic in this teaching from Jesus immediately. It gets hard, though, when we have to apply it to our own lives when someone has offended us. I mean, we understand, yes, that guy who was forgiven a whole lot should forgive $100,000, should forgive his friend who was owed him $10. But when it comes to us, we got it's hard to remember that the, the great mass of things that Jesus has forgiven us of. But then there's something that seems small in comparison to all that we've been forgiven that we're then asked to forgive of someone else. It gets extremely difficult. Let's talk a little bit now, ready, about why forgiveness can be hard and then really understand what it is that we're doing when we forgive. I think we're often reluctant to forgive because we don't want to let go of our anger. Um, why do we get angry? People get angry when they sense a loss of control. Uh, so say someone has harmed you, sinned against you. Um, I think I used this example before. Let's talk about someone stole your watch, okay? Uh, when your beloved watch was stolen, you have a sense of anger and righteous indignation about that, right? Because in the moment that the watch is stolen from you, you've lost control over your ability to keep possession of your watch. And we want that control back. And that feeling is what makes us mad. Um, and say that the that I stole your watch 10 years ago. You can still be mad at me 10 years later um, because you still feel that harm, that anger, that righteous indignation in the now today. Uh, we continue to feel angry. Uh, this is why, friends, <clears throat> it is so difficult and sometimes impossible. Listen, to forgive someone with whom you're still angry. If you're still mad at them, you can't forgive them. So forgiveness is as much about getting over your anger as it is about forgiving the offense. Am I making sense in this library? Say yes. And this remains true even when we um, are over that fact about control, like say, that we're not predominantly not angry anymore because of the loss of control. It could be that we're just still mad about the crime that's been committed against us. Um, and this anger, friends, is one of the reasons why forgiveness is important. Uh, Jesus asks us, tells us to forgive, not just because it's logically correct. As you've been forgiven a lot, you should also forgive a little, right? Jesus also knows us and loves us enough to know to say, 
this anger that you're carrying around because of this offense, it is not good for you. You need to let it go. Um, as you know, I like to do a lot of cooking these days. Um, and a lot of what I do starts with a saucepan, you know, uh, bring water to a boil. Um, anger's like that. You know, it's like the heat that boils the water in the pot. Um, and some of you have had your water boiling inside of your heart and in your mind for years. And what forgiveness is, is just simply turning off the heat so that the water can stop boiling and your soul can be calm. But what's hard is, and I think this is what my friend um, had such a struggle with, is we want to satisfy our own sense of judgment, <laughs> our own sense of justice. Like what you did was wrong. And the reason why I can't forgive you is because if I do, then what I'm saying is that what you did was really okay when it's not okay. Uh, the problem with my former church member was she made herself the judge, the jury, and the executioner at all times of any offense that was that was done to her, large or small. Um, and listen, even when you're not angry, even when uh, your offender in no way deserves your forgiveness, uh, we will withhold our ability to forgive them because we don't want in the least to appear that we're condoning what they did to us. It's not okay. Because it's not okay, I won't forgive you. Because if I do forgive, am I saying that it's okay? I want you to start to look at forgiveness a new way. Of course, forgiveness is not saying that what they did is okay. What forgiveness does instead is turn the heat off the boiling pot so that you can start to live your life in a more free and healthy way. Uh, but that's why it's hard, right? Because forgiveness may feel like we're letting our offender off the hook without punishing them. And we want to see justice done, right? We want to see them hurt some way in the sense that we ourselves were hurt. Um, so letting them, forgiving them, can be so hard, especially in cases where you cannot see with your eyes anyway, any pain or recompense or punishment that was done to them because of the offense that they made against you. So you're holding on to this anger is like, like the only punishment that is being made it out against them. But what I need you to know is the only person that you're punishing is yourself, not them. They don't feel that anger from you. They're not thinking about you. They're on doing their life. But you've got the pot boiling because you feel like they need to be punished. Here is the powerful thing about forgiveness is. This is what it is. Forgiveness, in fact, is removing yourself once and for all time the role of being the punisher for the offenses that are done against you. Can you do this? You got to lay the role of being the punisher down. Here's what I mean. Let me read Romans 12, Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 19 to you. Again, this is out of the message. Romans 12, 17 to 19. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Can you do that? Can you believe that? Can you give that over to God? You live on this side of heaven, eager to discover the beauty in everyone. As much as it is within you, try, and get, try to get along with everybody. Laying down this insistence on getting even. What does Paul say? It's not for you to do. Let God take care of it. We wish to harm as we ourselves have been harmed, right? The whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth bit. Remember what Mahatma Gandhi said? If that's what you do, then the whole world is going to be blind. Um, anger 
wants to be um, released, shot out like a gun, like it. Anger wants a satisfying infliction of pain. Um, so when you can't do that to the person that sinned against you in a way that will satisfy you, what do we do? We keep it inside and we harbor it and we nurture it and we grow it. And for many of you, that feels like the second, the next best thing to do. Well, since I can't punish them, what I'll do is I'm just going to remain mad. I'm going to hold on to this grudge forever. This is what my friend said. I don't forgive. And you know, why does holding a grudge, why do we do it then? Because holding a grudge feels good, doesn't it? It allows you like to rehearse and 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 remember and replay that crime and add and attach some crazy motives to it, right? You can create like a whole mini series of drama around one incident. And that feels good, right? It's our it makes us feel better about ourselves and the way that we are looking down and judging the other person. But do you get how messed up that is to go through life this way, my friends? <sighs> Holding a grudge does feel good. I get it. But you know what feels better? Letting those grudges go. Not allowing the people who've transgressed against you to have that sort of power in your life and in your head and in your heart. Uh... Here's another reason why forgiveness is hard. And maybe this is going on in your, uh, your mind and heart tonight. Is uh, I can't forgive, I won't forgive because they haven't apologized. They need to come to me and say they're sorry, understand what they did wrong, and apologize to me. And when they do, and I'll be the judge of the apology, by the way, I will consider forgiving. Let's talk about apologies for a second. The power of an apology is enormous. Uh, that could actually be a whole nother teaching series that we could do down the line about like how to apologize. Um, I think there's a great book. I mentioned this before. I forget who wrote it. Uh, that's literally called How to Apologize. Um, and for some of you today listening to this, there are people that you need to apologize to. Um, but And you need to apologize with sincerity and with humility. Um, and I think not even seeking forgiveness so much as um, releasing yourself from the, the pain and the um, discomfort of knowing that you've transgressed against someone. Uh, Listen, the power of an apology cannot be overestimated. So if you need to apologize to someone, I encourage you to do that. But here's the other thing. Maybe you're still mad and are holding a grudge against someone who's apologized to you. They've come to you and asked forgiveness and you've said, no, I'm not going to do it. You can apologize to me all you want, but I'm not, I'm not giving it over. Jesus has something to say about this too. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Again, out of the message. Listen to what Jesus teaches us here. He says, be alert. If you see your friend going wrong, correct him. If he responds, forgive him. Even if it's personal against you and repeated seven times through the day. And seven times he says, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Forgive him. Wow. I ask you, has someone apologized to you and you're still withholding forgiveness? Why is that? Do you know what more you need them to do for you to let them, uh, to you for, to you, for you to forgive them? Think of this. Probably there's nothing that they could do for you to forgive them. So, especially if they've apologized. Extend that forgiveness, okay? Uh, so there's a power in an apology, but here's another thing that makes forgiveness hard is that uh, maybe you have other people in your life who have um, trespassed against you uh, and they have not apologized to you. 
uh, they are refusing to acknowledge that they've done something wrong. And this can block our ability to forgive them too, right? Um, I know for sure that many of you listening to this are looking for an apology that is never going to come. Let me say it again. I'll lean in so you can get it. They're never going to apologize to you for this. I'm sorry, but it's true. You need to stop looking for it. For some people, they're never going to apologize because they can't see it. They're in a bill, they are actually unable to understand and articulate their transgression against you. So you're asking them to see something that their eyes aren't able to see. That their brain isn't able to process, that their heart isn't able to comprehend. Um, some other people, right, you're seeking an apology from, who know they've done you wrong, who know that they're looking for an apology from you. Uh, they know that you are looking for an apology from them. They know you want this apology, and yet they're still withholding it. Why? Because they know you want it. Their lack of giving you an apology is another way they're trying to hurt you. Um, so see that too. That could be a reason why they're not apologizing. But in that case especially, I want you to notice, please, with me carefully. Listen, how much power you have given them over your heart and over your life and over your, your, your soul and spirit. You're letting them live rent-free in your head. They need to apologize, and they haven't apologized. They know they've done me wrong. And so they, you think about them all the time. All, maybe you think about them every day. Think about them every night before they go to sleep. S stop giving them that power. Get them out of your mind, out of your heart. How do you do it? Forgive. It's the only way. Still, some of you are looking for apologies in ways that you don't know, seeing apologies from someone who can't give it because they've died. They really can't give you one. And you still are seeking for this understanding of their hurt. And they, they can't, they never will. Um, so that is some words about why it's so hard to forgive. Um, and let's talk about a, sec a second now, moving to like <clears throat> what forgiveness is and how we can actually do it. Um, here's, one of the, here's an explanation that's really helped me a lot that comes from a more psychological point of view about forgiveness. Uh, when we are seriously angry with someone and we're holding a grudge against someone, we like attach a role to them as our enemy almost, right? We, we see them as someone who is incapable of being a good person, incapable, incapable of doing good. Um, and so our relationship with them gets broken because we now see them as a bad person. Uh, I've had this happen to me many times over ministry. In ministry a, a lot of times for things that I will never know what it was that I did wrong right that just some there will be a person who will speak to me on Monday that is not speaking to me on Wednesday and why I don't know but it's like their perception of me and who I am and my ability to be a good person in the world like shifted it's like a switch that was click click maybe you I'm sure you've had this happen to you too Maybe you've done this to other people. Unforgiveness changes who people are in our minds and in our hearts. They go from having a white hat on to a black hat on. A good guy uh, to a bad guy. Um, so what forgiveness does is opens our heart now to the possibility that they could in fact be a good person. That they are still capable of being doing good and being kind and um, and they might actually be someone with whom uh, we might want to have a relationship again. Um, 
again, it's taking ourselves out of the seat of judgment that decrees their bad and yielding that to God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Uh, again, out of the message, Colossians 3, verse 13 and 14, listen to this. Paul writes, So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the, war, in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. I love that translation. So much of Colossians 3. Talks about what we wear, what we put on. Do you see how anger is that? We like wear anger. We wear grudges. We, we wear um, bitterness like a garment. We cloak ourselves on it. We choose to put it on. And what Paul is teaching us here is instead dress in the wardrobe that God has picked out for you. Did you hear that? Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet, straight discipline. Be quick to forgive. And whatever it is that you put on, put on love. When you're wearing love, really intentionally wearing love as an act of grace, as a gift from God in your life, you'll find that um, that anger, that bitterness is hard for you to wear. It just doesn't fit anymore because you're wearing love. I'm making sense in the Jane Wilson Library. Say yes. Um, so forgiveness then, do you see, involves that, involves seeing that the person who's harmed you is more than the person who's harmed you, <laughs> that who they can be in your life is more than this person that's committed this offense. It's making the decision not to write them off. Because whether you, your heart and mind can understand it, you got to understand how God looks at that person as a person that he loves, a person that is capable of doing good in the world, that is worthy of admiration and respect and friendship and grace. So, you know, in a way, forgiveness is the, is the repeated discipline of looking at people the way God looks at people. Aren't you glad God doesn't look at you through the lens of the ways you've sinned against him? You want God to look at you through the, through the eyes of grace and love. You expect him to. And what the teaching here is from the Bible is, if you get that, now you see how God expects us to look at each other in just the same way. Forgiveness, then, beloved, takes maturity, doesn't it? A kind of Christian maturity that God alone can call you to. Um, forgiveness changes the way we look at people from our offender uh, and be able to look at them now through the eyes of compassion and mercy. This is the work I had to do with the woman I was telling you about at the church I used to serve. Like, I was having a hard time in my the way I just viewed and understood this person. And so I had to like pray and ask the Lord's help for me to see her through his eyes. And you know what he did. And I was able to find a love and a compassion for her that I couldn't find. Um, because why do people harm us? Why do people sin against one another because they're seeking power they're seeking a happiness that hurting you might achieve and when you can understand that and really get behind how they're choosing wrong actions over right actions uh, and understand what that need is in them 
perhaps she can find a little compassion, a little grace, a little mercy for them. With me? Uh, so, coming in for a landing here. Do you see now how forgiveness requires us to let it go? Let it go. You got to let go of your anger. Let go of this need you have to punish. Let go. This is a really crazy need <laughs> that we have to teach a lesson. Well, I They just need to understand why what they did is wrong. And I'm here to teach them a lesson. Please. First of all, who made you the teacher? No one. And what makes you think that they're going to learn a lesson from you? <laughs> You're trying to teach people. I mean, God has got to do. God has got to do that work. You got to let the Lord do that sort of stuff with me. So you got to let go of this need to teach a lesson. You have to let go of the of the desire to hurt them like they hurt you. To harm your harmer. Uh, you have to let go of this foolish notion. It's not foolish. It's totally understandable. You got to let go of this of this notion to say that if I forgive them then I'm condoning an action that is unjust. Uh, and so if I, if I forgive them, then I'm doing an injustice to myself by, um, you have to let go of that need for justice with me. Like, let that go. That, that need that says, I can't let it go because it's wrong. Hmm. And then here's a big one. You have to let go of your expectation and your requirement that the person who harmed you will ever change. You know, maybe they will, friends. I'm not saying that they're not gonna. Um, sometimes forgiving someone, receiving commit forgiveness from someone is an incredible, powerful event in, in someone's life. And it can lead them to healing and hope in a, in a new and powerful way. But I'm telling you, if you make their change the requirement for your forgiveness, it's really not forgiveness. You, that's one of the things you got to say it with me. Let go. Let go your expectation and requirement that the person change. Learn their lesson. Uh, and let's be clear. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. You know, forgive and forget. Yeah, I don't know about that. You can forgive and not forget. Amen. All right, I'm not saying that you squash the injury against you. For, because for some of you, this is a really big thing. It isn't forgetting. Forgiving is a different thing. Um, and also, forgiveness doesn't mean necessarily restoration to the role and the place that the person maybe had in your life before. Forgiveness does not mean, you know, you and I were used to be best friends and I did this terrible thing against you and now in order to, I won't know I'm forgiven until we're back to the way we were. The way we were. That's not what it is, right? Forgiveness doesn't mean that. With me, doesn't mean restoration necessarily. What it does mean is that we move on from the hurt that's been done to us. That we let this need for justice and this expectation, all that expectation, that grudge, we just let it go and release it to God. Um, and listen, being forgiving isn't something that Jesus wants us to do on a case-by-case -case basis. This isn't like a transactional thing so much as it is something that he wants us to be as a person. He wants us to be forgiving people. Um, like he wants us this to flow out of the person that he's calling us to be. Like, because it's like, like the reading from Colossians said, it's the garment that we walk around wearing. <clears throat> because this practice of um, being a forgiving person is the way that we become our very best self, the person that God has created us to be. How do we become the people that God wants us to be? I think that forgiveness is one of the major ways that God forms us into being that person. 
forgiveness is like the pathway uh, to being a changed and holy, uh, gracious, loving person. Uh, one final word of scripture, uh, and then we will pray and call it a night. Uh, I want to read to you uh, verses 38 to 48 of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. Again, this is out of the message translation. Uh, let's listen to Jesus teaching on murder from through the eyes of what we just learned about forgiveness in Matthew chapter 5. Here we go. 38 to 48. Here's another, Jesus says, here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer, for then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, the good and bad, the nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. Your kingdom subjects, now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Wow. What an amazing translation of those verses of the Sermon on the Mount. Live graciously. Live generously. Let your enemies bring out the best in you, not the worst. Uh, many of you will know that I, uh, during the pandemic, watched the entirety of the Great British Baking Show, and that's birthed in me and uh, a love for baking. Uh, my daughter Kelly, oldest daughter Kelly, has now got me watching a new show that is modeled off the Great British Baking Show called The Great Pottery Throwdown. It's not about baking, it's about pottery. Don't worry, I'm not going to become a potter. It's too hard. But I am amazed at what these people can do. You know, they take a lump of clay and they make these beautiful things out of it. They stretch it. They mold it. They throw it on the wheel and do the thing with the hands, you know. The things they can do with even with porcelain. Uh, uh, and then it's molded, straight, stretched, and then it's put in the fire. It's baked. It's subjected to this heat and pressure, and then out of it comes something beautiful. This is us. We are the clay. God is the potter. He's, we've, we're under his hand. He's forming us. He's cutting the things away from us that need to be cut away. And once he gets us kind of like we need to be, we go in the fire. And the fire is, is, is not just the hard times, the, 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 the things people have done against us, I think the fire is also our self-reflection, our willingness to understand what's going on in our hearts and our lives and learn from it, be changed by it. That's when we start to be the person that Jesus is asking us to be in the Sermon on the Mount, to live out our God-created identity. Uh, and I'm going to close with this. Um, 
maybe the question that you have on your mind today is, you know, what about the things that are, by the world standards, unforgivable? <clears throat> things so difficult and so terrible that they really can't be forgiven. Um, even in that, God's calling us to be the kind of person that can forgive. Because you know what? The Lord wants you to live in freedom. Uh, think about if there was a book that was written about your life. You know, the, bi the biography of your life. Um, how main of a character are the people that have sinned against you in the book of your life? Are they the dominant characters that are writing the story of your life? Is, is the story of your life going to be a reaction to the things that have been done against you? Like the next chapter in the book of your life is going to be about them and how you're still in this, the water is still boiling in your heart and mind because of them? Or are you ready now? Are you ready to you be the one that writes the next chapter of your life? Are you ready to take back that power that, that you and your unforgiveness have given them over the future, the course of your life? Are you ready to stop losing sleep over this person? Are you ready to um, live in a brand new way? And uh, listen, I, I'm not trying to make this easier than it is. Um, if you need therapy, please go get therapy. There isn't a person that here in this today that doesn't need therapy. All of us do need to sit with someone and help us in our self-reflection. Um, uh, but if this is especially difficult for you, get help, right? Come, you can come talk to me about this stuff if you need to. Uh, uh, um, whatever help you need, get it. But I'm saying it takes courage to live in the sort of freedom that Jesus has called us to here. And I want to ask you, I want to invite you to this freedom. Uh, the freedom of being a person that um, can determine the next chapter of their lives and a person that is wearing the cloak of love. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. You can do it, and God will help you. Let's pray. Uh, dear Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We ask you, God, to um, bless us and be with us as we walk this journey of forgiveness. Um, and we take a moment, Lord, and ask you, who is it that we need to forgive? Uh, what are the issues of anger in our lives that we have kept the kettle boiling on? Um, our little hands, Lord, don't have the strength to turn off the heat, uh, but yours do. So we ask you to just grab a hold of your love and your mercy uh, and just believe in our hearts the ways that you've forgiven us so that we then can turn and forgive them. To let go, Lord, of our need to repay, to judge, to be the executioner, to be the teacher of lessons. Lord, we just lay all of that just down right now before you and ask in exchange that you give us your peace, uh, your grace, your kindness, your love. We thank you, God, for this time together. Uh, and we ask your blessing upon our church, our families, all those that we love. And uh, we ask for your help in what you're doing in our lives and in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for this time today. Uh, have a great day rest of your day. And remember, God loves you.